And welcome to the Confound Millennial, starring Stephen Sturvin Michaels and featuring special guest Jonathan Reels. Hi. You left out my middle name. Your middle name? I have to say my, the middle name? My middle name is Four. Now, is it legally numeral, your middle name numeral. or is it, you know, your chosen middle name? Uh, I do not recognize the authority of the government to uh, have dom- dominion over my name. So I refuse to answer your question. Okay. That works too. Uh, as you can see, ladies and gentlemen, this is going to be quite a fun episode. <laughs> so, <laughs> Jonathan, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Who the heck are you? Uh, I'm just your average guy who grew up in rural Georgia and just moved to the big city with bright lights uh, in the headlights, headlights, uh, of the car driving on on the road to try and be famous, and uh, I didn't I didn't do that. But you know I've done some cool stuff. I'm an actor, uh, possibly a comedian. That's uh, up up for debate. Um, I feel like that word can be used to describe anybody. Uh, and uh, writer, political activist in in my youth, and apparently now. Um, so yeah. That's that's me. Just a jack of all trades over here. Um, yeah, I think I think the thing is we've all become uh, political activists in the past few days, and uh, we'll get well, into I don't know that. About, well, I don't know about all of us. Uh, uh, well, yeah. I mean, I guess maybe so. You can be a political activist for uh, the wrong reasons, but uh, exactly. But it, you know, that's but that's been coming uh, for a long time. Um, Especially, I'm going to say probably over the last five years, everyone has has felt like uh, they're out doing uh, the Lord's work in the political arena on Facebook for the most part, and and Twitter. I don't I don't really know what happens on LinkedIn, but uh, I'm sure I'm sure somebody's over there causing a ruckus. Can somebody check on LinkedIn? I feel like LinkedIn's kind of. I mean, at the same time, I feel like. Anybody that uses LinkedIn is a shady kind of person, but I feel like if you were to line up all of the social media websites and uh, give them personalities, LinkedIn would be a homeschooler. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, what? Where would you put MySpace? MySpace? Because it's still out there. It's still out there. It's still operational. I mean, when I think MySpace, it immediately just triggers deep memories of seeing kids. I mean, I've got a lot of fond memories associated with the the term MySpace, but uh, the MySpace that's there now, well, that's not my MySpace. That's not my MySpace. I didn't even know it was still running. Oh, it's it's uh, it's honestly terrifying that uh, it one is still running, two that they continuously update it and make it in absolutely terrible like it's bizarrely uh badly des- it's so badly designed uh its functionality is atrocious um there's some sort of glitch that uh locked everybody's uploads like everything from your profile is still there from from 2007 or 8 or whenever it's all still there but it somehow they accidentally encrypted it to where they can't get back into it, and neither can you. <laughs> oh my gosh, and that's scary because uh, uh, you know, actually nowadays computers might be powerful enough to handle my profile because I got really into customizing it, and I would add this and that to the point where I tried to open up my MySpace page and it crashed my computer. I I actually uh, support. Going back to the the uh, HTML based MySpace system, um, I think it was actually pretty beneficial uh, because you when you did want to customize, you had to learn how to to a basic understanding of coding um, to be able to make the adjustments. Um, Facebook, uh, Twitter, none of these social media profiles of today they they have none of that stuff. I mean, I feel like it was a valuable skill. We had an entire generation of amateur web designers, and we just wasted it and threw it away. 
And, you know, I had already had a, Tom. I had already had a little bit of experience with, uh, doing that kind of coding stuff because of Neopets, surprisingly enough. Do you remember Neopets? I, I remember it a little bit. Um, it was never my scene. It was originally like a college pet app or for people in college that couldn't have pets and then it turned into a kid's game, but they still had, a, it was still, a lot of it was geared toward adults, like you could code your own shop and everything. And there was even like a Neopets version of the stock market. So I knew people. Yeah, yeah that, I, I started dealing with that kind of stuff, um, but mine was like a way nerdier. Uh, I, I ran a... Um, a web page on uh, X page, like the uh, I don't know if you remember that it was a free web page designer, and you had to you had to build it all HTML yourself, and it was a uh, Weird Al fan page, and also a fan page for the wrestlers uh, Kane from WWF and X Pac, and it was a fan page for both of those two. Um, uh, it's, complete mashup of of two unrelated fandoms and uh Wait, the ramblings so you had, of a of a sixth grader you had two different pages or it was one page oh, no, for one, all three one page of one page all of those together now what would you give today to be able to get those three in a room uh i don't know if i really want that <laughs> quite honestly <laughs> I mean, I don't know if you know anything about Kane, but um, the the wrestler Kane uh, is actually the mayor of Knox County, Tennessee now, and is uh, an, an economist. Um, oh. So I don't feel like he'd be a whole lot of fun to, uh, you know, hang out in a room with. But he, I mean, he's an interesting guy. How do you change Someone your life fun. career that that drastically? I I really don't know. Um, I, I feel like I've I've heard him say he just kind of was he had a lot of free time on his hands. He flies around on planes between matches, so he just studied the economy and uh, invested his money and saved and when it was time for him to move on, because, I mean, you can't get uh, slammed around your entire life. I mean, some people do. The Undertaker's sure doing it, and it's not going so great. But, um, you know, you you find something you're interested in and apparently it was the economy and now Kane is the mayor of Knox County Tennessee and apparently doing a really good job well congratulations Kane you know live live your best life be your best you Weird Al still kicking it being Weird Al and X-Pac is uh selling uh uh pirated versions of his own merchandise from the 90s but he throws like weed leaves on it and changes the letters and censors it and has a weed company now i think so i mean i guess maybe all three in the same room would be interesting oh yeah definitely sounds like a party i'd attend governor weird al yankovic and uh stoner tycoon sounds fun (laughs) stoner tycoon yeah, that's that's the one game uh, of the Tycoon series for PC in the 90s that never came out. You had Roller Coaster ca- Tycoon and uh, probably Train Tycoon. There was a whole Tycoon series, but you never had never had Pothead Tycoon. No, you didn't see that. the The 90s were a much tamer place or tamer time. <laughs> it, yeah, a timer tame. A timer tamed. Oh my! Look how the turns have tabled. But speaking about wrestlers, uh, you are really, really, really into wrestling. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, I mean, it was a, a very large part of my childhood, um, as I've already established. Uh, I, I built a uh, – my, my grandfather was in the Navy, and – at some point, whenever he was in the Navy, he was tasked with building a boxing ring. And um, I was really into wrestling. And one day, uh, he brought up, like, you know, we could build a wrestling ring. I had to do that in the Navy. And I was like, yeah, that's the best idea ever. And so he would tell me what I needed. And uh, I would spend my 
$10 allowance, little by little, buying piece by piece, one piece at a time, Johnny Cash style. And I'd buy a turnbuckle or two, and I'd, I'd buy some rope. And I, I, I learned very quickly that regular rope, <laughs> garden variety rope, is not the right rope. Um, right. He didn't tell me what to, like every single step. He was like, this is what you need to do, you know. And then I would go do it in my own childish way but I, I eventually built a wrestling ring and my friends would come over and we'd uh, fight each other in the backyard so yeah uh, very big very big part of my childhood and it, it never really went away like I mean sometimes wrestling sucks uh, there people have said when wrestling is good it's great when it's bad it's terrible and I think that's fair right and it's uh, you know it you can tell that uh it's still carried over into your adulthood with uh, the movie you were telling me that you've been working on that was supposed to come out last month. Was that right? It was supposed to come out last month. It was going to have its uh, premiere uh, up in Atlanta. Um, and I'm not exactly sure the name of the theater. And I don't know if it's going to be there, you know, in the future. So I don't want to like promote the name of the theater and it'd be at some different theater. But. Uh, yeah, the premiere was supposed to be last month, but it was postponed uh, due to the plague. And uh, yeah, it should be, you know, hopefully safe at some point to put it out. And uh, then it'll start playing around uh, the con scene around the country and especially in the southeast. Uh, because I don't, I mean, I don't know if you are aware of this, but uh, places like Dragon Con and things like that, they have a huge... Uh, wrestling fan base that comes to it and in fact dragon con has its own wrestling uh promotion they do dragon con championship wrestling every year and they they hire some names of uh famous wrestlers that are not currently employed by a company that has them to where they can't go work for smaller you know promotions and they they put on a fun wrestling show and have people in the crowd they're all dressed like uh you know, cosplaying as their favorite wrestlers and stuff. And it gets, it's a wild party. Yeah. It sounds, it sounds like I, I never would have expected to find wrestlers at dragon con of all places. And Kane usually is there and he's, you can talk to him about the economy. (laughs) Yeah. How was your weekend at the, uh, comic con son? Oh yeah. I went, uh, met my favorite wrestler and we talked about the economy. It was great. We learned about quantitative easing. It's fa- your father just sheds a tear, realizing he might have a chance. He's not a complete <laughs> nerd. But, yeah, uh, yeah. So, um, so the marks, to, yeah, uh, the marks is the name of the movie. And um, I co-wrote that with my friend Joseph Lavender. Um, it was made by Black Flight Studios. I'm, I co-star in it. Um, and... Uh, a lot of it is loosely based on what went on. Uh, you know, there, there was a lot of backyard wrestling in the '90s, obviously, and it. But you know, some of there are references that only you know me and you know ten other people that went to middle school with me will get of things that you know happened for real in my backyard. But you know, the name of the uh, wrestling promotion whenever I was a kid, the promotion quotation marks in my backyard was the Mosh Pit Wrestling Association, and that is still the name of it in the movie The Marks. Um, I jokingly brought it up at a writer's meeting, and they were like, there's not a better name than that, so we're going to use that. So I guess it's technically based on a true story, but we don't we don't put that at the beginning. It, it's, it's about as true as the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I love that, the Mosh Pit, man. Uh, so what is, I mean, obviously the movie is about, uh, nineties backyard wrestling, but is there anything else you can tell us, uh, to get us a little Uh, hooked on it? So it's, um, well, it's, it's an ensemble film. So there's a lot of, uh, plot and storylines and it's, you know, honestly could have been a, a long drawn out series, but, um, you know, it's all contained in one movie, but, uh, so basically it's about, um, Mosh Pit Wrestling Association is run by, uh, two different, uh, uh, myself, um, 
two different people, myself and Maggie Lightning. Maggie Lightning is the daughter of famous professional wrestler from the 70s and 80s in our universe, uh, Jack Dixon. And uh, they do not get along, but Jonathan just so happens to be a giant fan of Jack Dixon. And chaos ensues. Um, <laughs> that I don't. I really don't want to give a lot away because I am actually very proud of the fact that this movie is incredibly unpredictable. Um, for me, that is one of the things that makes uh, professional wrestling great when it is great. Is that you can be shocked. You can have these moments where you're like, I didn't see any of this happening at all. Because wrestling can also be incredibly predictable, and so can comedy movies. Comedy movies, for the most part, are relatively formulaic. And that is something that, uh, like, my favorite stand-up comedian of all time is Emo Phillips. And Emo's jokes are constructed in a way to where every single punchline is completely unexpected. And even... The punchlines that are mid setup leading to the punchline also are unexpected. And it weaves you in and out of these turns um, and takes you places that you weren't expecting to go. And that's something that I feel like comedy movies lack. I mean, people watch, uh, you know, thrillers and psychological thrillers and horror movies and they look for the twist. And let's watch comic book movies, they're full of twist. Comedy, which is built on twist comedy movies tend to not have any twist. You know, you've, you've got a great point there and like it is comedy is built on twists. It's all about, you know, the punchline not being expected. And most comedy movies, I can watch a trailer and I can tell you exactly what is going on. Yeah. You, you know, the ending by the time the movie starts, um, it's that that's, most comedy movies, and I don't want to paint every comedy movie with, with that broad brush, but for the most part, I, I would say that it's an accurate representation of comedy films, which don't get me wrong. I, I absolutely love comedy movies. I will still watch them. I I love to laugh as much as anyone. Right, exactly. Like, uh, I love I love comedy movies, but I can't focus on movies anymore. It's a uh, weird, I think it's part of, you know, uh, just the way we're getting content through our phones now, getting used to things is, uh, you know, 10 second clips or little bite sized memes, you know? Uh, yeah. I mean, I hear people say that, um, I tend to see it happening. It hasn't happened to me yet. Um, I am definitely still a, a binger, you know, I will watch every episode I possibly can of a show when I start to watch it. Um, I will watch multiple movies back to back in the same night. I like, I, I'm a, I'm a binger when it comes to media. So it hasn't happened to me yet. And I hope it doesn't. Yeah. I used to be able to binge stuff all the live long day. And now I can barely sit through one 30 minute episode of something. I mean, uh, I, let me ask you this. Um, and this is something that I feel like uh, has been lost long before us. Uh, can you sit and listen to music? Like, I, I don't mean um, watch a music video and I don't mean to put, put music on in the background of what you're doing. I mean, actively listen to music. Oh, I I. Music is a big part of my life. Uh, so far, for the most part, our guests on the show have been musicians. Um, I I just sit and, uh, you know, whether it's the guitar or lyrics, just I can sit and let a song take me to a completely different place. Yeah, I feel like that's lost uh, nowadays. Like, I don't, I feel like... Nothing infuriates me more than trying to show someone a song and them talking through it. Or oh my gosh, that <laughs> happened to me yesterday. Listening. I feel like it. I'm eventually going to snap. I'm eventually going to just lose my mind. And that may be the day that that uh, I have a mental breakdown and you know 
have whatever happened to you that makes you not be able to actively watch uh, movies anymore. Maybe I'll maybe I'll snap and I won't be able to actually watch movies and maybe I'll I'll turn into one of those people that can only listen to music in passing. I don't know. I think one day eventually I'm just going to have a mental breakdown and become a different person. And it's going to all be because somebody didn't listen to a song that I was trying to show them. Look, and I don't think that's an overreaction at all. Just develop an entire new personality and become someone else. That's that's what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what happened to me, pretty much. People wouldn't listen to the music I was trying to show them, and I just lost my freaking mind. Was that when you became Sturvin? That is when I became Sturvin. Uh, you see, I've always been... Uh, I've been Sturvin since I was 13, an old youth pastor of mine uh, gave me that nickname uh, because it was a mix between uh, my full original name, Stephen Irvin. Sturvin hmm. comes very quickly. And then That's interesting. Uh, add in a falling out with some family members, a change of a middle name, and you get Stephen Sturvin Michaels. Runs off what the denomination? tongue a little better. What denomination were you? Uh, Church of God. Ooh, me too. Okay. You ever hear of uh, something called Teen Talent? I Yeah, absolutely. Uh, me and uh, some of my buddies uh, won a couple years uh, for, uh, what what was the category? Contemporary Band? And, yeah, er, yeah. And uh, Human Videos. I directed and won one for the state of Georgia with that. Did you did did you go to summer camp in Tifton? Yes. Yeah, I meet me too. Oh dang. So we probably <laughs> seen each other a lot more than we just that one time I remember. <laughs> uh, uh, probably so. Yeah. Probably so. Um I Yeah, um I think uh, the last time, let's see, 2006 was my last year at youth camp. I'm going to say 2006. Uh, and uh, would've... That, that year, what was that? I wouldn't have uh, met you by then. By the time that I was going to the youth camps, I was uh, working them as like a high schooler for the middle school camps. Right. I was I was working high school for the middle school camps, too. But then there was there would still be the one week that you would, uh, you know, it'd be your camp. So I would be at that as well. I would be there like the whole summer. OK, that's cool. I uh, I had some friends that did that kind of stuff that uh, they were in a uh, leadership program and they just lived at the camp for the summer and they loved it. Yeah, uh I basically lived camping for a very large portion of my childhood because, uh, see, I would have Church of God youth camp that I would go work, but um, I could only go do that if it uh, timed out properly uh, because I was a professional Boy Scout, and I would work at the Boy Scout camps uh, at Walwood Boy Scout Reservation in Quincy, Florida, for the Suwannee River Area Council, and uh, I would do that for the majority of the summer. And if it timed out just right where I, I was off duty, I could go work at the Church of God Youth Camp. So I was I was a camping fool. <laughs> um, speaking of Boy Scouts, I got a question. Uh, you know sure. uh, how Facebook reads your mind and knows everything you've done throughout your life? Mm, absolutely. Have you been getting, like, recently this past month, and I hadn't even talked about being in the Boy Scouts, but I was in the Boy Scouts growing up, and I quit. Are they the, asking you if you were raped? Because yes. Because they've been asking me a lot. <laughs> yes. But the thing is, with me, like, or they're asking, uh, you know, they're vaguely saying it. You know, raped is what they mean, but I'm like... I did get strangled by another Boy Scout and quit. Maybe I can get compensation from that as well. <laughs> um, I mean, I think it would be a different lawsuit, but yeah, uh, <laughs> obviously. But um, no, nah, uh, the you Boy know, Scouts. You know, I bad. never, I never had any, I never had any issues. Like, 
uh, like what they are implying with these lawsuits whenever I was there. And not to say it didn't happen. I, I'm, I, it's obvious that it happened to someone. Um, but it never happened to me. The, all, the weirdest thing that ever happened was, um, you know, I had like a tent mate. And uh, the first night he was getting ready, he was like, just so you know, make sure you face the other way because I sleep in the nude. And I was like, this is this is weird. Like, you don't need the why? Do you, why? Why? <laughs> Some BDE the, right there, man. It, it just, I I mean, I understand it was hot, but like, I mean, he was in a sleeping bag, you know, oh, man. and had like a divided, divided tent with like a mosquito net between the two of us, but still weird. I remember uh, just, there was one time I went camping with some friends. Uh, it was another uh, church group related thing, and uh, it got so cold that night. And the youth pastor uh, looked, or he looked up, and uh, he was like, "Is anybody actually asleep?" And, and everybody was like, "No, no, no." He's like, "All right, guys, I don't mean to get weird here, but who wants to line up and cuddle for warmth?" <laughs> and we were like, "If you don't oh, say is- cuddle ever again," but no, he uh, he didn't mean. Or he didn't say cuddle. I uh, forget what he said, like huddle up for warmth or whatever. Ah. And we were all like, you know what? We're in. It was that cold. We shouldn't have been camping. And uh, next uh, thing yeah, you know. I, I would say I would say that's different. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. cuddling, definitely not the right word. Yeah, not. I meant huddling, not cuddling. Uh, but hu- what it ended up being was just a line of guys all – shivering and then the pastor's dog decided to get in the group and he just sat right on the face of my buddy ray and uh and your and your buddy had the warmest night of all yeah you just hear him yell red rocket yum (laughs) uh but yeah um yeah, I mean, sometimes you got to do what you got to do whenever you're camping and sometimes you obviously shouldn't have been camping but if you're out there you're gonna you're gonna finish that camping. There's no going home once you're out there. Yeah, there was one. Were guy you in the Order brought... of the Arrow in Boy Scouts? I don't remember much at all about the Boy Scouts, to be honest. I've I've almost you know I didn't have like a bad time there, at least not as by far as you know some people have obviously had a bad time, but it just wasn't. It didn't. Other than like learning how to whittle. It didn't really mean a lot to me. Yeah, see, um, I was I was hardcore into it, and uh, I'm trying to figure out if I should tell a story or not because I believe. Uh, am I exonerated of the oaths that I took in Boy Scouts um, as an adult, or do they still last forever? That is that's the question I have to answer before I can continue. Have you killed a man since then? No, I haven't killed a man. Uh, I think that gets you out of it, but um, there might be another way. I didn't know there so, were oaths. What kind of oaths did you well, take well, in Boy Scouts? I, I, I asked if you were in the Order of the Arrow um, so we could compare war stories, but uh, you, 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 you would remember if you were in the Order of the Arrow. The Order of the Arrow is the uh, Boy Scout Secret Society. Oh. You, you know whenever you see those Boy Scouts and they have the white sash with the arrow on it? Yeah. Okay. Those are members of the Order of the Arrow. And it is the elite faction of of Boy Scouts. Um, you are elected to it without asking. Um, you obviously don't have to join, but you are elected without ever knowing that you are up for it. Um, and there is a uh, very strange, uh, but kind of, I mean, it's it was fun in its own way, initiation uh, process. Um, and then, of course, there's, uh, you know, multiple ranks to work your way up to be a leader in the Order of the Arrow. And there's their, they have their own national Order of the Arrow uh, camp every four years, um, which I only went to once, and it was absolutely bizarre. Um, but, that, yeah, that's why I was asking if you were in it, because then we could discuss, but... Now I'd just be telling you a bunch of weird stuff. But but bizarre how you've got me intrigued now. And and like I said, you know, you are you are sworn to secrecy. So 
that's where I'm trying to figure out if, if that still counts. You know, I, I've been out of the scouts for quite some time. Am I allowed to talk about the Order of the Arrow? Look, man, don't don't break your vows. Don't break your vows for me. If you know, uh, or either that, you know, just uh, pretend that there's not people listening to this podcast, and that, that I'm talking easier. to you, and that you were in the Order of the Arrow, and and that I that know I'm, exactly. I'm what just you're talking, talking to a brother. About. Yeah. So that would be fine. That would be fine. Okay, so. Uh, whenever I was, uh, when I found out that I had been elected to be in the order of the arrow, I was at summer camp and every Wednesday night they have a, uh, family bonfire where the family can come and, you know, bring you food and have like a cookout or something like that. And then they go on their way home. And when the bonfire is over, they, uh, have, they have a ceremony. It's the Order of the Arrow ceremony, um, and they start calling out people's names. There's uh, definitely some cultural appropriation, um, <laughs> although I do believe, if I'm not mistaken, the the Native American dancers were actually Native American, <laughs> but everybody else involved in the ceremony definitely not. Um, but yes, they would have like a drum circle and all that kind of stuff. And um, they call out your name. They take you, they put you in a line, they take you off into the woods, and they tell you that you've been inducted and that you have to come back on a certain weekend. So that is step one, and then you have to decide whether or not you can come back and, and are you going to come back. And a lot of people, they tend to ask other members, like, should I? And they're not allowed to tell you what goes on. They're not. They're just tell you, yeah. Hmm. So, when you come back, um, you, it's just like normal camp at first. Um, you come back on another weekend, and uh, there's a big dinner at the dining hall, and everybody has fun. And then it's time for another bonfire. They take you to the bonfire. They inform you that you are no longer allowed to speak and you are sworn to silence for the rest of the weekend. They, they line everybody back up again and you are blindfolded. You put your right hand on the person in front of you and I, I left out a piece of the, the story here. When you're going to the bonfire, they tell you to bring your sleeping bag. Um, so you show up to camp, you set up your camp, you go to dinner and then they tell you, go get your sleeping bag and bring it with you. So you bring your sleeping bag with you. Um, so you uh, get in line. You're blindfolded and you put uh, your right hand on the person in front of you and the sleeping bag is under your left arm. You then go on a multi-mile hike curving through the woods in the complete dark. And eventually you feel the hand behind you come off your shoulder. That is because they have been dropping people in the woods throughout the hike, and you didn't realize that. Buddy. When they leave you, they tell you, stay here until we come back for you. So you do. You stay there until they come back for you, which is the next morning. You are still not allowed to talk. The next morning, they come, and they bring you a boiled egg and a piece of toast. They line you back up. And they bring you and disperse you throughout various areas of the, you know, the res the reserve, the reservation, or wherever you are doing this. And you are now going to do voluntary manual labor silently. So you end up doing a bunch of hard stuff for 14 hours straight. And at uh, lunchtime, you get another boiled egg and a piece of toast. <laughs> and, um, at the end of it, they have a ceremony. They tell you you can speak now, and then they have a giant banquet where you eat and stuff your face. And then, uh, in my experience, everyone plays Magic the Gathering. Oh, and, heck uh, yeah. And then it's over. And uh, quite honestly, the best Magic the Gathering games I ever played were in the Order of the Arrow. And uh, I I would be lying if I said that the Magic the Gathering was not the reason why I stayed in. Like, I got hardcore into Order of the Arrow. I would be there every single time if I could. 
and I was, especially any of my any of my friends. Come on, dogs. Seriously, if uh, do they not realize I, what we are doing? Yeah, I know, right? These dogs have no clue. You see the microphone? Come on, guys. So, um, where were we? Oh, yeah, no, I I started recruiting any of my friends who were in the scouts that played magic. I was like. Seriously, you have to join the Order of the Arrow. I don't know. It doesn't sound like it's a lot of fun. No, I'm telling you, man. <laughs> you got to join. You got to join some of the best drafts I've ever been a part of. They slang they cards were in the like Order nobody's business. Oh, man. Uh, speaking of magic, uh, you do you keep up with it anymore? I don't. Um, a few years back... Uh, I had a roommate steal all of my magic cards, and I took that as a sign that uh, it was time to get out of the business. Mm, yeah, once you lose your collection, that's probably the most heartbreaking thing you could go through because you just never could get back to the size of your original collection. Oh, yeah, absolutely not. Um, I mean, especially, uh, you know, all, a lot of this started... A lot of them, my my collection had started with uh, me in middle school, probably in seventh grade, and uh, continued throughout high school and you know farther. And um, I'm never getting back those those magic cards I got from those Order of the Arrow drafts. I'm never getting them back. Yeah, but you know what you can get though. You can go out to Walmart and get a Godzilla magic card right now. Like uh, Godzilla, Godzilla, Godzilla. Like Godzilla, King of the Monsters. I wasn't aware they were doing crossover now. Yeah, they, um, this is the first, well, they've done, like, because it's owned by, Wizards of the Coast is owned by Hasbro, so they've right. done, like, just exclusively for, like, Comic-Con like if you show mm -hmm. up uh, to their booth, you could get uh, like they had a My Little Pony set of five cards, and like I think they did Transformers once, but this is the first time that it's been a playable in set card. Did you? <clears throat> excuse me. Did you ever use um, or purchase any of the unglued series? I, I never have, but I because only because I didn't have the friends that were also interested in playing it. But I was very interested myself. Yeah, I had the um, I had the entire almost the entire unglued series, and I, I built an unglued deck. And obviously, it's not something you can play in any official capacity. But I had a friend who was. <sighs> bizarrely good and he, I could never beat him and he was confident that he could beat anybody and I was confident that he could beat me but just for fun I said how about you play the unglued deck I'll play the unglued deck against your best deck and he agreed um, it was the probably the only time I ever beat him <laughs> and uh, there is a card in there um it's bureaucracy, and uh, it it's the entire card is fine print, and you have to read the entirety of the card out loud every turn once it is played. Yes, and I am definitely I, I'm certain that the reason why he ended up losing was because of the psychological warfare aspect of the unglued deck. It's not that the cards were any better. It's just they were so freaking annoying that if, if they were played against you, that it just it starts to tear you down mentally. And I would I would like to see Magic uh, bring those cards into the actual game. That is an aspect that I I think they were, you know, they were meaning it as a joke, but I think they should do that in, in the actual game. Well, you know, they released uh, two other sets as well. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, I forget what it's called, but they just recently released a box set that includes decks made out of cards from all three. Really? See, you just might have got me back into the game. 
Yeah, um, I forget the name of it, um, but uh, go to go to Walmart or wherever, and uh, they got it in the Magic Isle. It's a box with a squirrel about to beat a goblin up on the front. So, uh, yeah, I'm 100 percent going to have to uh, look into that. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't, uh, I was uh, just. I just now bought my, not to talk about magic all the live long day, but I just now bought my uh, first pack of the new set. And, you know, they haven't, they might not even be releasing any new physical sets after this one because of the virus. Wait, so hang on. They might, they might end making physical cards or the because of uh, the virus until until it is safe because they can't with the rules that you've got now you can't have competitive play anymore you can't have a store packed full of people here to play you can't do a draft you can't do anything six feet you can do six feet we can i can play six feet most shops though aren't big enough to have more than five people staying six feet away <laughs> i've been to I a mean, few fair enough I've been to a few that are bigger, but those closed because they expanded so quickly. And uh, mm. but it's just it shows that this thing, you know, it's affected everything, even down to magic, because <laughs> now it's all going to be online until this is back to some. Yeah, our uh, our comic shop and magic shop, and <laughs> board games and all that stuff. It all it all closed down here where I am so uh, all because of the virus so that that was very unfortunate I, I've seen the effects firsthand myself well ours closed because they were slinging drugs out the back and they got caught but uh, you know I get it I apologize again for these dogs being so inconsiderate look man I don't need an apology from you I need an apology from them it's not your I mean, fault I, it's I can theirs. try I can try I mean I really I can I, I don't I just don't they're stubborn you know what? It's fine. It's fine. You know, you won't, you can't win them all. Can't win them all. So, um, usually, you know, I, uh, try to stick to kind of a 45 minute deal, but if you don't mind going on a little bit more, there is two more things I wanted to talk about. Listen, I, I'm completely fine with staying on as long as you want, because this is getting me out, uh, of hanging around family members so this is my excuse please keep me on i completely understand that um so sorry i'm a crackhead and i was thinking like man how much longer can you go without another cigarette my friends make fun <laughs> of me i'm so bad at it uh like you know i've done uh a show that uh you should be familiar with because i think you work for don't you work for Seth and Willie Fred, the comedy I duo? Do. I do. Um, I I co-write for them and produce uh, their music. So so yes. But uh, so I've done their. They recently had started doing. I don't know what they're fully calling it. I've been referring to it as the Steel Cast. That that is the name of it. The that Steel is Cast. okay. I thought it was still undecided. I don't know. <laughs> but, <laughs> I I believe they tried to throw around different names, but that one just somehow stuck. So, but I've you know I've been uh, joining them for that, and uh, and once once I get a couple of steel reserves in, I can't not chain smoke. And so I the first night I did it, I realized I was just in my apartment chain smoking, and I wasn't supposed to be smoking in there. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's just hope there's no video evidence of you doing it somewhere floating around the internet. Oh yeah, definitely, definitely no video evidence. But um, the the questions I wanted to ask you first, um, you know, you asked me, you were surprised that it wasn't the first thing out of my mouth, and I know you get asked a lot about this, so I wanted to wait and get some of my other questions out of the way, get to know you a little bit. But you know I gotta ask you a little bit about The Walking Dead. Of course. Of course. So uh, what do you want to know? 
first, uh, how long were you on it? And uh, uh, one one entire season. One entire well, season. Technically, it was two seasons. I, I came in midway through uh, season seven and worked until the mid portion of season eight. So technically one entire season. So you had never been on it before uh, that season? No. Okay. For some reason, I was imagining that most people that they reused a lot of zombies for uh, non-zombie. I was faces never. Um, later. I uh, I was on a different AMC show called Halt and Catch Fire for the entirety of season three. Um, I was one of the coders uh, that that worked uh, at the video game company Mutiny. Um, and at the spoiler alert, you've everybody's had time to watch it. Um, it's on Netflix. Um, at the end of season three, a lot of the coders are, are fired. I was one of them. Uh, and by a lot of them, I mean, I believe all, but one of the coders from the series, uh, you know, that worked at mutiny, they were, everybody was fired. Um, I was one of them, uh, Josh Hoover, uh, which was fat Joey from the walking dead was one of them. Uh, Cooper Andrews. Uh, he was, uh, oh gosh, what is his name? The guy with the ax on the walking dead. Uh, I'm kicking myself. I can't remember his name right now. Jerry, Jerry was his name. Uh, he, he, uh, also, he also worked at, uh, at mutiny on halt and catch fire. Um, so when that, that was over, um, I was called by the casting director and asked if I wanted to come work on The Walking Dead. And I said, um, I said I have to think about it because I assumed it was for something like a zombie. Right. And uh, I, I was trying to transition out of, out of, you know, doing small things that weren't going to have any positive impact on my career. And he was like, oh, no, I think you you're not understanding. I, I have something specific that I want you to do. And I was like, okay, all right. You, you put it to me that way. You know, I'd worked with him on halt and catch fire. I really enjoyed that job. That was one of the most fun experiences. Um, and I, I was like, okay, he's, he wants, he wants me. Uh, then, uh, I show up to work um, I work one day that it is just a brutal, hot summer day, and I'm dressed in all of these uh, winter clothes. Um, I had to go to multiple uh, costume fittings and things like that to get like the look right. And it was it was an, it was just like it was absolutely nothing. Like it wasn't anything cool. It was kind of meh. But that was actually just the. Uh, the like the big ending of the episode, like the tag where everybody kind of like swarms up on Rick. It was first time showing up in the junkyard. Interestingly enough, I was actually uh, hired to work that same night as one of Michael Keaton's uh, minions in the original uh, reboot of Spider-Man, uh, Spider-Man uh, Homecoming. Right? I believe that was this. Right. What it's called? Homecoming. Yeah. yeah, I was. I was one of his uh, minions. Uh, that worked for the vulture. Um, Were you completely really? cut out of the movie? Okay. Completely cut out. I was about to say uh, I watched that the other night, and I know I would have been yeah. like, "That's my boy." Yeah. Um. They they that movie was about five hours long in director's cut, and um, there was a lot of stuff that they did not use that would have honestly shook the entire Marvel cinematic universe to its core. Um, wow. But, uh, I think, I think from what I understood, they were rewriting it every day. Um, so there were some weird things that got filmed that I definitely saw go down, but I, but I was working days on walking dead and nights on Spider-Man homecoming going back and forth and completely regretting it. Uh, the walking dead portion of it because it was just like this boring thing. And I was like, this is not even special. This is nothing cut to a couple weeks later. I show up to, I show up to set, I get on the bus and people start radioing in 
bringing up my name and I'm like, like they're, they've been, you know, looking for me. Like, Oh, I've got eyes on him. And I'm like, I'm just getting here. I don't understand. <laughs> I'm not late. You know, as soon as I, uh, show up, uh, a PA grabs me and says, you got to come with me. They'll sign you in later. And I'm like, all right. They take me over to Greg Nicotero. And I don't know if you know who Greg Nicotero is, but I sure did whenever I was showing up. Um, he I do not. Who is, is he? the executive producer of The Walking Dead, but he is a special effects artist and he's also a director. Um, he worked on, I believe, all of Quentin Tarantino's movies doing special effects. Um, he worked on uh, Army of Darkness. Um, oh. He, he's, yeah, he's. We're huge a Evil Dead fans here at the Confound Millennial. Yeah. Um, he he's an he's an absolute legend. So, and I'm very surprised you don't know who Greg Nicotero is if you know Evil Dead. But um, I'm just uh, so, you know I know a little bit about everything, but I know everything about nothing. Fair Something enough. Something like that. Yeah. So they bring me over to him, and uh, he kind of gives me like a rundown, and the script supervisor comes up and shows me a scene. It's like, this is what you're going to be doing today. And this was the day of the beginning of the red umbrella guy, which was bizarrely enough in the script. Um, wow. Uh, it's such a strange situation. It, uh, it seems like it doesn't have a purpose, but it, are, have you watched the walking dead, uh, the episodes that I'm on? Uh, I've seen a few of them. I don't watch The Walking Dead religiously, but uh, I watched it. Uh, I did watch when uh, people started talking about you and the Red Umbrella. I was like, what in the hell is going on here? Well, there was an actual purpose of of the character. Um, it was all just a plot to lock Rick and uh, the entire group into Alexandria to slaughter them. Um, and it's like, it's foreshadowing that at the entire time. And you're constantly looking for what the umbrella is going to actually do. Um, and then it eventually is jammed into the gate and, uh, they try to kill everybody. Um, so it was a really cool, uh, you know, moment uh, that I got to be a part of. Um, and then, uh, the, the scene that, um, Negan is about to bash Carl's head in with a baseball bat. Um, right. During that scene, uh, during that scene, the entirety of the trash people, we're all standing around except uh, the, or the leadership of the trash people. They're all standing around and except for me, I'm, I'm there, but I'm just barely there. And um, I, I was working on that scene and Greg, it was the coolest thing ever because Greg was walking up and he started telling me Evil Dead stories. And that was like fanboy, just like, ah, that that was one of the coolest things ever. Um, and uh, he was talking to me and he was like, you know, I hate that umbrella. I hate this. I hate this thing that's happening, but it's in the script. And we're going to work with it. And I was just like, all right. <laughs> and I, that that was like uh, really demoralizing in a way. But at the same time, he was just like, now, listen, you you are one of the leadership of the trash people. So you need to be here to witness what happens. And I want to put you right up here uh, with Negan and everybody. But if I do that. When the tiger jumps in, he would kill you, and you don't die today. And I was like, "Oh boy, I get to work another episode." Get to because you don't know when you're gonna. You don't know when you're working. You, I didn't know what I was doing that day. They don't even give you the script. If, if you, if you, when Negan had, uh, I believe that seven minute long uninterrupted monologue when he killed Glenn, I'm right. pretty sure. That that Jeffrey Dean Morgan only had the script for less than thirty six hours. They they don't give you any information at all. So I would I immediately got excited. I was like, I don't care. Put me anywhere. 
I'm working another day. I did not know at the time that uh, that other day was going to be the next season and that it would include me being nude. Oh. <laughs> so how did that go? Oh, it was fun. I mean, it was absolute. It was absolute blast. Um, so the honestly, the best part of working on that episode was not. Well, it had like it, it was absolutely fine. Like you know, you're obviously not completely naked. Right. You know, like it's a TV show. They're not showing everything. Um, but I was very close to completely naked. But um, they they paid me to come and try on uh, the modesty devices, um, which had to be the weirdest thing I've ever been paid to do, but um, a very educational experience because uh, they gave me two options. Uh, one was essentially a flesh-colored crown royal bag that you would put everything in and, and tie it off. Dude, um, not going to lie. For some reason, Wish has been suggesting I buy one of those. Well, you know, you're about to get a lot more suggestions after this. Oh, yeah. Um, the other was something I didn't know existed, and that was a strapless man thong. How is it strapless? How does it hold itself up, you might ask? Well, I've got an answer for you, Sturvin. It latches itself to your pelvis with an adhesive and you grab a string and you pull it down and it, it kind of, you kind of pull in everything and pull it back and it, it tucks Buffalo Bill style. And <sighs> then the, the back has an adhesive piece that you just, a little, little small piece of adhesive and it, it, it latches right above your butthole <laughs> and you just, you squish it on there, and it sticks, and now you are a Ken doll with oh. glue on your butt hole. So you picked that one, right? I absolutely picked that one. Problem was, that adhesive doesn't really stick that well in the hot summer Georgia afternoon. The sweat gets to it very quickly, and you immediately have to switch back to that crown royal bag which i kept by the way um i'll mail it to you you know what absolutely we'll hang it on the podcast wall just make sure you sign it <laughs> well oh, it's God. already got my dna so that should be signature enough oh don't get my co-hosts excited come on uh so um Anything else about The Walking Dead that you're uh, itching to talk about? Or are you ready to move on to... Uh, uh, you know, any questions you've got, uh, you can lead me or into something. Or I I mean, I can talk about anything. I can go into a, a long tirade of self-indulgence at any point. So, just let me know. I do still want to talk about our little Facebook adventures of the past few days. Because sadly... Yeah. Uh, that is, you know, I don't want to be the kind of person that would just do it on Facebook, but not in real life, but I have anger issues. So I know my place is to stay inside. Um, yeah, I, uh, I'm not one to, to only do it on Facebook. Um, <laughs> Facebook is a, is a, a great tool to share information Personally, I do. I try to have respectful debates, even with people who are grossly misinformed. Um, it doesn't always work. I try to be respectful. Um, not everybody is down for that, um, but I definitely do. You know, move that out into uh, the real life, uh, the real world, outside right. of the internet, and and try to enact some sort of positive change. You know, I do that within... It doesn't always work. <laughs> ...within my circle, but, you know, being uh, the guy with social anxiety, I don't get out of that circle too much. But there's there's a reason I wanted to talk about it is, you know, I, I told you before uh, 
or when we were talking about doing this episode that I had one rule and that's not to get political and that I'm breaking that rule today. Well, I think you have the right person on to do that. Um, I don't know what your political beliefs are. I, I don't know if you know what mine are. Um, but I am definitely, I'm not some sort of sucker for partisan nonsense. I, I, I don't, I don't have time for it. Um, I prefer to let's figure out solutions. Um, and for me, all politicians are complete crap because, uh, we've had time, we've had time to have solutions. We've had time to fix these problems. We've known about these problems. People have complained about these problems. People have protested about these problems for decades if someone was going to fix it they would have fixed it already um and now it is important to hold everybody accountable everybody absolutely that is part of the system is part of the problem right that's that's pretty much where i agree with you too is i was just talking to a buddy this morning about it and i was like you know the thing is right now People are starting up by, you know, I don't know if you'd call it revolting, but I guess it is revolting against the cops at this time. And I was like, you know, the cops are an entry point into the government. That's where you start. Exactly. Like that's well, that's see, the cornerstone the, the right cops, there. The cops, uh, I, I would take it one step further. The cops are, uh, when you go to a restaurant – or when you go to Walmart, um, the cops, the cops are the greeter. The cops are the ones saying, welcome to Walmart. That's how low in position they are in comparison to the head of the Walmart corporation. Um, the cops, the cops are the guy or the, or the, uh, the cashier at the restaurant that you go to that says, Hey, welcome to Applebee's or no, they're the, they're the hostess at, at the, at the little booth that tells you welcome to Applebee's. That's how low they are in comparison to the head of the government or the head of Applebee's. Um, and the thing is though, is when you show up to those places, those, those people, uh, you know, don't tend to, um, throw you on the ground, choke you to death with, three other employees while another one watches in front of everybody buying their flat screen TV that, I mean, um, except maybe on black Friday, but that's not part of the point. (laughs) Right. Like the thing is, you know, I've, I used to pump septic for a living. So I literally have had someone cuss me out while I am covered head to toe in septic knees deep in a tank And I didn't kill that guy. I I don't know how I didn't, I guess, you know, since it's so easy, apparently. But, you know, I didn't kill that guy, and I never have killed a guy, even though I've had quite stressful situations at work. the, the, The thing is, though, is, like, even using the business model example is not really an accurate representation of how the government is supposed to work. At the end of the day, uh, every single American citizen is the president, the, the board of directors for the company. We make the choices, or we're supposed to. And, you know, the head, the, head, the figurehead that is supposed to keep all of the other uh, people in his department in line works for us. But people have forgotten that. We've completely forgotten that. We have so many people that are like, they're just doing their job. Well, I mean, yeah, they are. They are. They are doing their job because their job is to enforce a systemically racist system that's been in place for a very long time, and no one has done anything about it. No one. Right, and you know, uh, it's like you hear a lot of people saying you know, uh, not all cops are bad and it's not 
it it's not the problem of the individual cops necessarily even you know and like where i'm from here there's you know there's a few cops that i would you know turn to in an emergency like hey help me out buddy but there's others that a lot of them just all seem to have a uh, power thing you know what i mean i so i i i agree with you and um there are some people that i know that um they do the all cops the all cops are bad mentality which i think it's that is easy to do it's very easy to do it's easy to make the argument it's easy to make the argument of well if there if there were good cops they would turn into bad cops and it's easy to make that argument and i see the argument i understand where the argument's coming from but i do know this there are good cops Hello. The problem is the system does nothing to stop the bad cops. Right. Hello? Yeah, sorry. I lost you for just a second, but we had enough to figure out what you were saying. Oh, yeah. Well, I've got all the audio there, so oh, okay. you could hear everything. <laughs> you can hear it in post. We'll fix it in post. Yeah. Um, you, the viewer, you know. I don't know, but you know. That's all that matters. So... um so yeah, I, I mean, I I had a I had a friend who was a f- uh, former cop, and he brought up that he had seen a lot of things in the line of duty that were wrong, and that he could not he could not continue that job anymore because his complaints fell on deaf ears, and he eventually quit, and then personally filed reports with higher ups about the stuff that he had seen. Um, And I don't want to say that maybe all the good cops should do that because then at the end of the day, you still have the good cops leaving their job and leaving all the bad ones there because the system is set up to protect the bad cops. Right. I mean, we we have uh, we we have a system where it's right now the the police officer who just killed George Floyd, um, he he's going he is going to be prosecuted in some fashion. He's going to get some sort of punishment, but the punishment is going to be very low. And the only reason why he is being prosecuted is because one of course, uh, you have so many people talking about it. That is a major, major, uh, you know, factor in this. But also, the reason why he can be prosecuted is because the way the system is set up right now, we have qualified immunity. Right. And qualified immunity, it it's essentially the government says that – Anything they do in the line of duty can be justified unless it reads, meets a certain level of egregiousness. And that is that doesn't happen with any other profession. If if you're like if 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 you're working somewhere, if a restaurant gives everybody food poisoning and all the people sue the restaurant The court's not going to say, like, well, how bad was the food poisoning? Just a little diarrhea? Mm, Nah. They're fine. They're fine. Let them keep doing what they're doing. That doesn't happen with any other thing. It doesn't happen with anything in life. But it happens with the cops. If you kill someone, if you kill someone the same way, are you going to get off? No. Right. You're not. And, like, the thing is, I saw uh, something earlier today that was talking about, you know, it was comparing – the cops to the military and you know the military they can be in an active war zone and when they're told like bring this person back they get back and usually they're in one piece you know yeah um that's very true um i, I a lot of my military friends have been um very very vocal about this situation um because they do see that this is uh, an issue of just these these 
so many of these cops do not have any type of sufficient training, background checks, no consequences. If you don't follow orders when you are in the military, there are severe consequences. If you don't follow orders, uh, well, you know what? They're not even orders for the cops, quite honestly, when it comes to this situation. They can get off. They right. they can get off easily. Um, I, I'm so frustrated with it. And, and the thing is, is I've, I've been trying really, really hard to explain this to my right leaning friends. And a lot of them are, they get it, they get it. And the, the best way that I, I've been trying to put it to my right leaning friends is you know, you hear the you hear conservative people say, um, "Well, you're not going to take my guns," you know that kind of thing. That 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 always comes up in the gun control debate. And I told them, I was like, you know, listen, if you if you say this, just know that if that day ever did, if that day ever came, these these would be the people that would come for you. And do you think they're going to just come in and confiscate them and take them peacefully and you can go about your day. No, you, you're going to die. <laughs> right. Um, uh, the, the, like with any law period, with any law, you have to think about one thing um, is, are you willing to enforce that law at the barrel of a gun? Because that is what a law is. Not every law is enforced at the barrel of a gun. A lot of laws that shouldn't be in any way, shape, or form enforced at the barrel of a gun are enforced at the barrel of a gun. And most of the time, it's towards black people. Right. That's, that's, that's just a fact. And you, you people are dying over their traffic signal. You mean... I mean, the thing is, like, you know, we were we were raised in a school system, you know, with our age range, we were raised in a school system that taught us that all this was over and behind us. So you see this on the news every now and then, you know, while we were growing up and it's like, eh, you know, it's a once in a while thing. But I've seen it happen so many times now, you can't deny it's an everyday occurrence. You know, we were just lied to. This isn't over. You know, there's still, you know, I saw I saw a video yesterday uh, that was a guy talking about, he said, we don't want to not get arrested. If we do something wrong, arrest us. If we're stealing, arrest us. If I hurt somebody, arrest me. But don't try and execute me on the sidewalk. And I think that that's a fair way to put it. I mean, the way that I like to live my life um, is probably the way a lot of other people like to live their life. If I don't have a problem with what other people do as long as they don't hurt me, and I don't want anyone to try and uh, stop me from doing something that I want to do if I'm not going to hurt them. Right. And – if you can, if society could just come to that agreement with each other, um, we would have a vastly different system because you wouldn't have so many uh, restrictions on your freedom that can be used as an excuse to murder you. Obviously, we have to reform the system, you know, to to make it uh, where if someone does murder you for for a minor infraction that they are going to be prosecuted um, and they are going to, you know, lose their job and anyone that has helped them is going to lose their job. Um, we have to address that obviously. And that needs to be addressed first. But in the future, we do need to look at our rights as people. We do have to think about what kind of society we want to live in. Right. Um, I just know it's not the one that we got right now, but I know out of all the things I've seen 
and my short life so far, this whole year looks more like the beginning of a radical change than anything else. Now, will that change be good or bad? I don't know. But I just know after this year, nothing's going to be the same again. Uh, yeah, you you are right. I don't know if it's going to be good or bad. Um, I am hoping for the good, though. Um, yeah. And, you know, I, I made the... I made the post and I challenge uh, everyone to do the same thing. But I said on Facebook uh, a couple of days ago, I ask all of my friends, are you willing to take the time to run for office? And I'm, I understand that not everybody is going to be uh, – they're not going to win. You're not going to win. Most people are not going to win. The The machine's set up to keep anyone who is not corrupt from, from truly winning. Um, right. Like we've got but, how many people in this country right now? And uh, our best. 370 million. <laughs> 370 million. And, you know, our best two options for uh, presidency right now are Trump and Biden. And I'm not going to say anything about either of those two, but what I am going to say is that's the best we got. That uh, is what they tell us. I mean, that is what, just... we, what we are told. And whenever I say run for office, I don't mean run for the presidency. Um, I I think it is completely within the realm of possibility that people that do recognize the problem that we're in you we can we can all easily just run for county commissioner most of the county commissioners in your county i'm gonna guess are running unopposed yep which they've been there for years and years which to me it's your duty to run against someone if they're running unopposed because people need options Right. Um, you you may not even win running against someone who's unopposed. They, people may be very happy with their county commissioner, but people do need options, and it's it is very difficult to run in partisan races. Um, you know, even unopposed uh, partisan races. You know, there are a lot of loopholes and uh, stipulations that they've put to keep people from running. Um, and I'm not saying that it would be easy for everybody to run for office, but it, I think everybody that is truly concerned should look into at least getting their name placed on the ballot for different positions because, you know, some of us, some of us will actually win it. Somebody's going to win and that person is going to be able to use that position and use their voice. And even if it's just for a county, they will be able to push for change. You got to start at home. You know, you got to start somewhere. And uh, if you're not looking out, if you don't, if you if you're not looking out for your county, I don't expect you to be able to look out for anything bigger than that. You know, you got to care about your home first. You're you're absolutely right. Um, I I I haven't uh, <laughs> I haven't decided what my plan of action is going to be moving forward. But, um, I have run, I have run for office once before. Um, it was a, a situation where, uh, the state of Georgia added a congressional district for the state house. And, uh, after adding the district, uh, after the census information that justified them adding a new district, um, they drew the district, uh, from my hometown and, the counties next to me that, you know, I spend a lot of time in whenever you're in South Georgia, like, you know, uh, it, you have maybe five places to eat in your county. So like, if you want something different, you got to go to the county next over and, you know, it's, it's 15 minute drive. It feels like it's forever when you're from the country, but you know, it's nothing if, if you've lived in the city. Um, but, uh, you know, I've spent a lot of time in these places. I knew people in all these places and they, they redrew our district to have this little sliver of the closest 
large city that wasn't even anywhere really that close to the places where we were all living. And it had this little sliver that went just in and surrounded an existing congressman's house. And uh, they did that so they could appoint him to be our representative because nobody has ever run for the House of Representatives from our area it, within it, ever, as far as I know. I've, I've looked into it. I never saw anyone from our counties ever run. So they knew nobody would run. So they had his name. Uh, he was a sitting congressman, but he wasn't from our area. And he uh, was from a somewhat competitive race where people would challenge him. Um, and they drew his house into ours, and he got himself put on the ballot, and uh, nobody's going to run against him. So they essentially appointed a congressman to an area that he wasn't from. Um, I didn't like that, so I decided to run too. Yeah, I mean, uh, I definitely, I get that, you know, especially, you know, I'm a small town kind of guy, like, I want my representation to be from my small town, you know? Absolutely. Um, and that, you know, I, I definitely had, had an entire, uh, platform of things that I wanted to talk about. Um, but the thing that I told the little old lady, whenever I knocked on her door to talk to her is, listen, I'm from here. Um, you probably know my parents or my grandparents, or my uncle, you know somebody who's related to me. I'm from here. This person is not, and he is getting put as our voice in the state legislature with no election because he was going to. He, I mean, he got a hundred percent of the vote. Like that. That's what. That's what happens if nobody runs a hundred percent of the vote. And. Nobody even has to vote for him. Everybody could abstain except himself. And he still got 100% of the election. So I take it it didn't go well, though. I I, I, uh, I was anticipating that, that question. Um, you don't have to answer. But. No, no my, my campaign um, uh, went very well. Um, I actually think I could have won, but I did regretfully dropped out of the race at the last minute due to both of my parents passing away. But um, I definitely uh, regret not sticking around, but at the time it seemed like the uh, appropriate thing to do. Yeah, I do. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a big uh, believer in you got to do what's right for your mental health. And I don't think you can ever beat yourself up for... I mean, you can. You can beat yourself up all day long for, uh, you know, dropping out. But in the end, if it's best for your own mental health, you know, you got to do you. At the end of the day, you got to do you. I, I think uh, what uh, bothers me more than any part of that situation is that still nobody runs against him. Yeah. Still to this day, nobody runs against him? Uh this will be the uh, fourth election cycle for that seat um, this year, and uh, he's been unopposed uh, since that election. Wow. That's just, I mean, not, not a lot of people. I mean, you know, you see a lot of people, like we were talking about, a lot of people are posting on Facebook right now, but how many people are actually really really interested in politics at least enough to where if they don't like something they want to try to do something against it a lot of people and this is a mentality for everything that you could do in life a lot of people are just waiting for somebody else to do it that is true um and don't get me wrong uh i can fall into that category myself um i've had every opportunity to, you know, jump back in and do this, you know, try to accomplish the same thing that I accomplished before, but I haven't done it. I keep saying, well, somebody's going to be fed up because I knew every, 
I knew every member of the city government. I had a meeting with the mayor where we talked about we talked about how, you know, he has never even uh, he'd never even came to our city to even meet with him to even say, hey, listen, I'm running. I'm probably going to be your new representative because the race is completely wide open and no one's running against me. Uh, he never came and had a meeting. He never had a meeting with any of the mayors or city government. He he's a ghost to them. And, you know, they were all very, very stressed out about it. And they were all very enthusiastic that somebody was at least trying to do something. Um, even if we disagreed on finer points of, of policy, at least, at least I would be accessible. Right. You know, um, uh, and I, I was hopeful that at least some of those people, the people that were stressed out, that that were upset by the situation, you know, they're they're not the mayors anymore. They've served their term, and you know, they're they've moved on. They could have easily stepped up and done it, and uh, I really thought they would have, but they didn't. Hmm. I don't know. It's uh, yeah. Do you have any other uh, comments, anything that you'd like to put into words about, well, really anything we've talked about so far that, uh, but especially, I know you've got a lot to say about uh, what's going on in the country right now. Is there anything, any enlightening words you'd like to sprinkle upon our ears? Nothing more than, I think I've made all the points that I want to make. But if I had to sum it up, I would just say that uh, we can do, we can fix this. We can do something. Um, we're probably going to have to try a little harder than just posting on Facebook. Yeah. And, you know, I wanted to throw in the, the, biggest, the biggest reason why I've been so upset about over all of this is just because where I'm from, you know, I'm from a small little redneck town where Same I've here, grown brother. up with racists in every way, shape, or form in every part of my life. And I remember when they started, when the football players started taking a knee during the national anthem, my old boss at the time lost his mind. He lost his mind worse than a lot of people are losing their minds right now. And he would go off every morning until he finally stopped watching football. And uh, But he would go off every morning about how people needed to, or these people needed to be deported for d being a traitor to the country and all of this stuff. I'm like, dude. And like people are, people are saying now, why don't people protest peacefully? And some people are, some people aren't. But the thing is, they tried the most peaceful way. People tried the most peaceful way, and it wasn't the right answer. And they're trying a different way. And I'm not saying it's the right answer. What I'm saying is, I don't think there's a right answer because the people that need to hear the answer aren't asking the question, if that makes sense. I think everything that you said, uh, it, it all made sense. <laughs> yeah. But, um, I mean, there's really not, uh, there's not a, a lot I can, uh, I'm not the voice. I'm not the voice that, uh, people need to listen to right now. You yeah. know, um, I, I see what is going on, but it's at the end of the day, um, it's not, it's not happened to me the same way it's happened to other people. Right. And my message would be to anyone who is questioning any of this stuff, just have a conversation with any of your black friends. Exactly. Any of them. They will tell you something that will open your eyes to something that you had never even considered. I don't know what it will be in specific. But I guarantee you, you will learn something. And with so maybe, that, so maybe that's my final thought. <laughs> yeah, it's a good final thought. I just, you know, 
your our viewers aren't coming here to have their mind changed or you know the people that are listening to this most likely already agree with all of our points but just remember people be good to each other Ra- raise some hell but be good to each other you know like i hate seeing this you know people taking down just small mom and pop shops and stuff like that like that's not the way we got to take care of each other and i yeah, think that somehow we managed to to not get into a uh, a giant kerfuffle of of uh conspiracy theories and uh blame with any of this um and i'm i'm proud of myself for not taking myself down that road <laughs> Oh, if you ever want to talk conspiracy theories about anything else, I'm down. But, <laughs> but no, nah, um, I just, you know, like I said, we don't get political on this show, but I are usually. I don't think this is a political today. issue. It's not. It, it really it isn't. Be. But this my. This is a uh, human rights issue. <laughs> and if people make it a political issue, that is their choice. Right. You know, I just, I couldn't sit back and not talk about this. I just, I couldn't, and I know I've already run it into the ground uh, today, but, you know, I just, I had to say something. I had to get it out there that, you know, the Confound Millennial, as messed up as we are, you know, we stand with everybody. You know, we believe in we believe in hope and being kind to each other, and that's the reason I really started this podcast uh, to begin with was to spread hope to people uh, in the form of laughter, really, and uh, like other podcasters had done for me and YouTubers before them, and uh, I guess that's. That's my closing statement for the day is just, like I already said, be kind to each other, have hope, and uh, we'll all get through this. We'll get through the riots. We'll get through the coronavirus. Hell, I think we're already through the murder bees. I think the murder bees, I think it's over. Um, Now we just have to to worry about the volcanoes. The volcanoes, oh gosh. So, uh, let's not get started on that topic, but I appreciate yeah. you having me on. Thank you. And, uh, uh, thank you so much I for hope, coming on. I hope that uh, whenever uh, whenever I decide that I'm going to fight the system, I'll, I'll be able to come on here and uh, at least announce that I'm running. And I'll try not to get too political. Absolutely. No, we'll uh, we'll we'll make a special law for you you'll be our head of politics on the confound millennial jonathan (laughs) oh boy oh boy (laughs) i don't know if i can handle that kind of pressure look man we always call this podcast our own little cult and you just got offered a position in it don't turn it down but uh well you'll have to let me know what flavor of kool-aid and we'll go from there all righty well ladies and gentlemen this has been the Confound Millennial, starring Stephen Sturvin Michaels and featuring Jonathan Four Reels. That was beautiful. I'm tired of these Confound Millennials. <laughs> <laughs>